Good evening. My name is Ranger Megan and I wanted to welcome you into my home for another installment of Rangers After Dark. Tonight I wanted to talk about something that's especially important to me and discuss some of the LGBTQ history of the Longfellow House for LGBT History Month. Specifically though, I wanted to focus in on Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's little brother Sam, pictured here, and talk about his life, his relationships, and the community that he found himself in. And if I'm being perfectly honest, his sometimes terrible taste in men. To begin though, I feel like it's important to briefly explain how you even interpret LGBTQ history prior to the 20th century in the first place. In the 19th century, people did not have the same words and phrases and understandings of sexuality that we do today. They didn't have words like gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender to identify themselves. What that does not mean though is that these relationships and these identities didn't exist. In order to interpret 19th century queer history, we have to meet these historical figures at their own level, use their own words, or use phrases that would have been more understandable in their time. The most accessible term that we have is romantic friendships, which is a term that I really love because it's useful in describing a wide spectrum of romantic, sexual, and platonic relationships that a person could have. The truth of the matter is, men were allowed to be far more affectionate to each other in the 19th century. They would share beds. They were allowed to declare their undying love and devotion to each other. And this was something that generally wasn't questioned because the idea behind it is eventually you would get married. You would start a family. And for the most part, that's what happened. But not in every case. And that's where we get into the complexities of it. Romantic friendships can be used to describe the relationship between Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and his best friend Charles Sumner. It can also be used to describe the relationship between Oscar Wilde and Bosie Douglas. And we know for a fact that Oscar and Bosie had a lot more going on there. Now that we've had a very quick introduction into Queer History 101, Let's talk a bit about Sam. When it comes to Sam, a lot of this history is unfortunately missing. Before he died, he destroyed almost all of his journals, and we have very few letters that remain throughout the course of his entire life. But what we do still have is a gold mine. The biggest collection of correspondence we have is the letters between Samuel Longfellow and a man named Samuel Johnson, who was a fellow classmate at Harvard and a fellow minister later on. We have hundreds of letters between them where they talk about pretty much everything. We also have coded references written by their friends, comparing them to Greek figures comparing each other to classical Greek figures, and also one friend even comparing their relationship to that of a marriage, which I think is kind of telling in its own right. One important point I do think I need to make for this video is one of the most popular coded references of the 19th and even into the 20th century was to reference the Greeks. The Greeks of classical times were known for having same-sex relationships. That's another can of worms altogether because of the specific nature of those relationships, but the fact that they were same-sex relationships at all became a very popular euphemism in a time before the LGBTQ community as we know it were able to use terms of our own. While I would love to talk about his relationship with Samuel Johnson all day, he was, without a doubt, Sam Longfellow's longest and most important relationship. 
there is still a lot more research to be done on them. And we have even more blatant and explicit evidence of Sam's interests in other men that go far beyond the platonic ideals of a romantic friendship. Sam's first infatuation was with a fellow classmate of his named William Drew Winter. In 1837, Sam wrote an entry in his journal that he later sealed shut with sealing wax to prevent others from reading it. The two of them had been friends for over a year at that point, but this was the first time that William Winter had ever been referenced in his journal. The journal, pictured here, reads, I have thought a good deal about him of late in my musings, and sometimes feel as if I should go crazy when I think of last year. I don't think I have made a greater sacrifice of inclination to a sense of duty, but it was not a hearty one. I was reluctant then. I have been sorry at times ever since. It was a strange infatuation, and yet after all my fears, might we not have been happy together? I loved him and think he liked me. William Winter would appear in Sam's journal a few more times, but it was fizzling out even then. It was very clear that this relationship was one-sided and to make it even worse, most of Sam's friends really did not like William Winter. Even Sam himself admitted that William Winter had a rough personality and basically said that he was a bit of a bad boy, that he hoped he could reform. Clearly didn't work out for him. William Winter eventually married and moved down south to begin running a plantation, which if everything else wasn't already a nail in the coffin, being an abolitionist I feel like this would have ended the relationship for good as far as Sam was concerned. As far as Sam goes, we don't really have much to go on for the next few years until the early 1840s when Sam writes in his journal about his first kiss with a man named William Tiffany. This moment was very important to him. He puts a lot of emphasis on this. And I also find it really bittersweet that when he writes this, he's 25 years old. It's right around this time as well that he first met Samuel Johnson, who was giving a speech at the Quad in Harvard Yard and was immediately smitten by him and writes about him as soon as he gets home. In the early 1850s, Sam moved to Brooklyn, New York, where he joined Walt Whitman's circle. Or, more accurately, Walt Whitman joined his. Walt Whitman had already gained a bit of a queer cult following after his publication of Leaves of Grass, and Sam counted himself among Whitman's fans. Their introduction to each other came through a mutual friend of theirs, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and apparently, Whitman showed up on Sam's front doorstep uninvited and completely unexpected. Which, I guess if you're Walt Whitman, you can do that. Despite the fact that Walt Whitman and Sam Longfellow had somewhat contrasting personalities, Whitman was known to be very laid back, very down to earth, whereas Sam was a little repressed and very straight-laced. But despite that, the two of them spent a good deal of time together during Sam's tenure in Brooklyn, and they talked a lot about same-sex relationships. Decades later, Whitman had quite a bit to say about Sam's proclivities. Walt Whitman, pictured here, wrote, a way back, he was a student of Leaves of Grass. I was told, liked it, called it Greek, said it was the most Greek of moderns, or something like that. Sam, however, was not, as I understood him, making allusions so much to the forms, 
As to the spirit of the book, the underlying recognition of facts which were the peculiar property of the Grecian, that was all long, long ago. Whether he still entertains those old views, I do not know. Three guesses what the peculiar property of the Grecian was referencing. Now, if I'm going to talk a little bit about Sam Longfellow's social circle, there is one more figure in his life that I do need to touch on. And his name was William Morton Fullerton. Another William. When Samuel Johnson passed away, Sam began to take on a bit more of a mentorship role to younger men in his life, encouraging their educations and their career goals and helping them to live out their dreams. He was a beloved figure to a lot of people. But his relationship with Morton Fullerton is a lot more complicated. In 1882, Sam moved back to Cambridge to live in the Longfellow House, which was the same year that Morton Fullerton first moved to Cambridge as well. Almost immediately, the two of them became acquainted. I believe one of Sam's nephews was attending Harvard at the time. And not long after, William Morton Fullerton became a frequent guest at the house for some periods, even living there. By this point, Morton already had a bit of a reputation for having relationships with men and women, and this was a reputation that would only grow as he got older. What's particularly frustrating about this relationship is that it really does only exist in scraps despite references to the fact that they wrote each other constantly and the fact that they also wrote each other poetry, we only have two letters in our collection from Morton Fullerton. We also know that they traveled together frequently, most often to the White Mountains. And in 1888, the two of them actually sailed together to go to a trip to Europe. Much like everything else, there is not much that we know about this trip. Sam had a habit of keeping travel journals, but unfortunately, no journal exists of this particular vacation. Whether it never existed or he destroyed it, we just don't know. But what's particularly horrible about this is that this is the vacation where Morton Fullerton enters into a relationship with Lord Gower, who was a close personal friend of Oscar Wilde, and Morton would very quickly join that social circle. And I don't know if Sam did or not. Sam would eventually return home and Morton would stay in Europe doing all sorts of things. Most famously today, Morton Fullerton is known for becoming the lover of Edith Wharton because we don't have enough literary references at our site in one form or another. When Sam died, he left Morton a large collection of his books, including first editions of his brother's poetry as well as a decent amount of money, too. Morton was clearly an important person in his life. And for all of the complexities of Morton Fullerton's own life, he genuinely did seem to have a very strong regard for Sam as well, and even wrote him a sonnet eulogizing him after he was gone, talking about the love that he still felt for him. It's the role of the National Park Service to preserve our natural and cultural sites and to interpret the history of all Americans. LGBTQ history is something that has long been sought after and for the most part has long been denied to the wider queer community. Sam Longfellow is an especially rich resource in this study and I am eternally grateful that I found him. Sam 
is an incredibly important historical figure for me. And I know that there are other historical figures that are equally important to people all around the world. This is why LGBT History Month exists in the first place. And we're fortunate at Longfellow House Washington's headquarters in that we have more than just this particular story to tell. While I could keep ranting about Sam Longfellow, and believe me, I could talk about him all night, I think what I want to do is end with this question. Do you see yourself represented or reflected in a historical figure? Why are they important to you? Thank you again for watching Rangers After Dark. We'll hope to see you next time.